Hi there, everybody. Uh, I want to welcome you to our uh, next panel. So this panel is very interesting. Um, well, sorry, they've all been very interesting. But, <laughs> <laughs> but this, this one is going to be. This is the most interesting uh, because we have members of uh, of my team, uh, and we're talking. We're kind of you know with DevNet trying to help a lot of people learn the newest technologies, learn to code, you know, learn the APIs for all of our different products. Um, but what's interesting is that DevNet itself is a product. It has a platform. We have a platform that's a website. We have a place for you to log into. We have a place for you to learn about APIs. We're trying to create a community for all of our folks and give you all of the software development tools. So it turns out we run a pretty large system ourselves. And uh, we're actually on a journey to uh, rebuild our own DevNet platform as a cloud platform using some of the newest tools. And so in doing this, you know, we've um, had trials and tribulations and successes. And this is the team that's really working on it, duking it out, um, really you know, talking through all of the newest technology choices. They fight a little bit. <laughs> and uh, what we wanted to do was expose those arguments and fights and our achievements you know, right here in this panel today. So, uh, so that's how we're going to be doing today's. Uh, so I would like each of you to now introduce yourselves. OK. Uh, and also, can we? Yes, we're here. Uh, Fabio Giannetti, I'm a principal engineer and um, interested in microservices, monitoring and metering. Those are th things that kicks me. I am Ken Owens. I'm the cloud CTO for, for Suzy. And I, um, I, I, according to Suzy, I am responsible for, to all of her team. They can, they can call on me with any questions. And, um, <laughs> and I get to be the answer man. So I'm, I'm excited about that. Excellent. <laughs> Uh, Nermeen Esmail, uh, I spent uh, lots of years working on embedded systems. Three years ago, I uh, was introduced to the fascinating world of cloud. I fell in love with it. And today, I'm working on the cloudification of the DevNet platform, which is the topic of today's panel. Hi, uh, my name is Edwin, Edwin Zhang. I'm the uh, director of software development and also user experience for DevNet team. Uh, I've been with DevNet since beginning three years ago. Um, it has been always a very interesting journey. Uh, my name is Hank Preston. I'm a member of the developer evangelist team within DevNet. And it's my joyous job to help all of our customers and partners and SEs understand what it is that DevNet does, what do our products do, how do they work, uh, examples of how to use our APIs, so on this panel, I get to be the troublesome user of the, por the platforms that they all build. So My enemy. <laughs> <laughs> but remember, we, we recorded this. We heard you say that you have a joyous job. I do. I love my job. Edwin, he's not your enemy. He's your customer. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can I sit between you two? You might. <laughs> okay. okay, so uh, if I can ask some folks in the audience, um, how many of our, you are doing cloud development today? So how many of you are, uh, are I guess, a lot, how many of you are in the networking space or more on the infrastructure side? Who's on the infrastructure? Who's more on the application side? OK. Um, how many of you have used cloud technologies? Uh, OK. And has, have people used containers and microservices? Yeah? OK. So kind of a mixture. Great, great. Um, so what we're going to do is now go through uh, some of this talk. Uh, first of all, we're going to actually have Edwin kind of talk about what, what is the platform that we're building and why are we building it. So Edwin, can you jump in on that? Sure. Um, in DevNet, we have multiple services. Uh, services like the DevNet portal that people usually go to to find the introduction of the technology, uh, API document, et cetera. And also, we have learning labs, right? It's a self-pacing lab. You can follow the instructions and finish a specific task community, blogs, et cetera. Uh, most of these offerings were started uh, with different vendors three years ago. And uh, as we started to add more and more services to our portfolio, you know, some user experience issues appeared. For example, like once a user goes from one system to another, they need to sign in another time, which is quite annoying. And also, you know, once you have these different uh, monolithic applications, how to keep them consistent keeps the user experience streamlined is another very big challenge for us. And because of all these issues, uh, the project of DevNet platform comes into the picture. 
So that's why we started this project, that we want to gradually move everything into one platform, have a more streamlined and consistent experience for our users. And on the other perspective of the development, we also want to start to reuse more things that we built before. Because you know, not every application that we want to reproduce the signing and the social logging services, not everything that we want to have a database administration and a up services, et cetera. So that's kind of the intention of the DevNet platform. Excellent. Um, and then, uh, uh, so now if I can actually, before I go to this next slide, uh, let me ask all of you. So what are the biggest uh, advances in the cloud industry? You know, and uh, what are the biggest advances that are going on in the last couple of years? And what do we see in the year ahead? Yeah, so I'll, I'll start with that one. So um, I, I think the, the biggest thing we've seen is, um, you know, automation was sort of the, what defined cloud about seven years ago. And what you discovered as application developers were trying to keep up with the business needs is that automation and virtualization and just using cloud as a service wasn't good enough, right? The, the delivery time, the, the, the SLAs were difficult to meet when you're just leveraging like an Amazon service, for instance. And so, um, Something called microservices and microservices architecture and, and cloud native development started to evolve. And so in, I'd say in the last couple of years, what has, has just been kind of a hockey stick effect in the industry is that most application developers are now looking at how do they take their monolithic applications, break them into smaller, more discrete type of functions that they can then deploy at, at different locations and they can scale independently of each other based on demand or based on need of those services. So that's, that's from my side of it, kind of the, the, the what's really been big in the last couple of years. Excellent. Other views from folks? Yeah, I think from a developer point of view, uh, what amazed me is how easy it became to um, produce and deploy applications, right? And cloud has really uh, uh, accelerated that. So in the past, it was a, um, to go from uh, development into production was a very difficult and, uh, and, and, and a process that involves lots of teams and lots of coordination. Whereas today, uh, there are, the, the, the amount of tools and services available to allow that is amazing, um, as we have seen with Kubernetes and so on. If I can add on that a little bit, the part that excites me the most these days is the democratization of technology that's available. It doesn't take a gigantic organization to come up with a disruptive idea anymore. I call them the, the uh, it's probably not me, because I'm sure someone did it before I did, but the tech unicorns, right? Anybody with a laptop and a credit card can disrupt an entire industry today. And there's so many advances that have happened over the last five years that have enabled that. And it's really, it's anybody can be a developer, and it falls into that idea that every industry requires technology, requires applications, and it, it's this rapid change that is scary, but at the same time exciting, and causes so much strife on teams like all of our own. I want to introduce a uh, perspective from the user experience side. So with the advancement of the cloud platform and technology, uh, the visibility is really increased a lot. So right now on the platform, we can kind of monitor everything, like every user interaction, every user, uh, the, the small user experience that they have across different services, everything is under our monitoring. So that definitely gives us a lot of insight of how to provide a better experience to our users. Yeah, from my side, I think uh, the move from virtual machine to containers unlocked something that maybe is not obvious to many people, but it's the ability to basically confine the environment, the development environment. So before, when you talk about distributed applications, you can do distributed applications with VM, but usually you have to coordinate tools, libraries, and components across the board, which is very difficult to do because you need to fit everybody needs and someone will be compromised by that. But when you move to container, basically you can have teams that evolve and dis develop their application and they use the tools that they want in a fairly isolated manner, uh, and they don't have these big bang integrations that you will have you know, in a normal situation. Excellent. Um, so, uh, so now to go back to, so there's a lot of new opportunities that cloud gives, right? So a lot of uh, exciting things you guys just mentioned. Now let's go back to our practical problem of, uh, you know, we're trying to build a community platform for our developers. 
Um, um, can you talk about some of the community goals of our platform? So maybe Edwin, you want to talk community. about the, com the goals of our platform. Yes, from the uh, user experience and community side. Yes. Sure. Um, so one thing is, um, you know, before we have all different siloed applications, and um, you know, it's kind of difficult to get how users journey across different services and different offering. And that's something that we want to enable on our platform is uh, once you use a one, uh, switching from one services to another, it's kind of a very smooth journey that they won't feel like they're actually switching between different services and different platforms. So that's kind of the one thing that we want to ensure through the user experience. So that's as and simple as like I'm reading about an API, I want to take a learning lab, I want to use the sandbox exactly. and use those products. And take a step of that, you know, because I know that user is doing, let's say, they are uh, learning a uh, Meraki API on the learning labs. And then I can provide a more personalized journey to them once they switch into the sandbox or other services community that we can uh, pre-populate these related services and the content to them. So it's more customized personalization to them. And that's kind of another goal that we want to enable. Excellent. Um, so I think, I think sorry, one more yes. thing to add to that is the, um, there's an ecosystem around DevNet and there's an ecosystem around the community we're trying to build. And to date, it's been very difficult to add something into that ecosystem, right? And create something innovative or creative into that ecosystem. And so a big part of what we're also trying to enable is that the ability to not just create something on demand very quickly, that unicorn, the tech unicorn, but then be able to share that tech unicorn with your closest you know, partners and friends and say, hey, take a look at this. It's a good idea. Why don't you tell me what you think about it? And yes. then they can contribute back to that, that unicorn idea and make it even a better unicorn. Yes. Excellent. Yeah, and furthermore, uh, there's content that's in DevNet that's created by Cisco, but then there's going to be more and more content created by the community as well. So there's a lot of different types of data that we're holding as well. Um, so to go back to the slide, so this uh, first slide shows our system today, as Edwin just talked about, has multiple vendors. Can you guys explain uh, where it's going next? And you have a slide here to kind of explain that. And I think, uh, how many of you have situations where you have applications that exist today and are architected in a certain way, and you need to think about how to get it into a cloud architecture you know, using some of these new technologies? Do you guys have that problem? Are you working on that? OK. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, so maybe I can take that. So uh, the first thing we, we, we did was to agree on where we are going to be hosting uh, these different services. So for uh, the DevNet platform, we are hosting on AWS. Uh, then we agreed on microservices, because it makes sense for all the various business requirements that we have. So the second choice for us was how we're going to do the orchestration for all these microservices on uh, the AWS platform. So we ended up choosing Kubernetes as our uh, container orchestration system. Um, on top of that, we have the uh, cloud services that are common across these uh, 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 services, business services that we are going to be offering on top of that platform. So things like logging, monitoring. So we started to uh, specify these uh, different services and make them common across uh, our platform. And then uh, what Fabio calls the foundation services. So things like what Edwin talked about, logging, a, a login into registration. the system, uh, registration, user registration, uh, user profile management. Um, um, uh, so these common services that we can then use to provide the upper layer, which is really the business services that our user will be interacting with. So that was our approach for how we go into our new platform. I think a really important like, takeaway that Nomi mentioned, but you might not have picked up on, is that um, like, we picked that base layer of Amazon for different reasons. There was, you know, Cisco has, has relationships with Amazon. It's, it's uh, InfoSec approved, so there's easier ways to use it. But by picking Kubernetes as that, that abstraction layer, we can very easily pick up everything that we define as value-added services and DevNet specific value-added services, and we can move that to any other cloud we want to move it to, right? We're not tied to Amazon with anything we've built. We're just leveraging as a infrastructure, as a service for, for quick, easy, and, and reliable cloud services. And then everything above that 
is where we're adding our value, and that's where we can, trans we can move that anywhere we want in the future. Yeah, and even if you don't, uh, if you're not interested in moving your services from one cloud to the other, having labs, right, that's, that's, that's running within your organization, Kubernetes add this value that your labs, your actual staging and deployment uh, production are very similar because you're abstracting uh, using Kubernetes. Yeah, so one thing I want to add on is, uh, you know, for us, we really ideal situation is we really want to extract most of the service uh, on top of the container as a service, right? So uh, we want to focus more on our, our platform services, which is shared across different business, uh, uh, business logics. And then we have our own offerings, which can be like a learning lab, sandbox, et cetera, et cetera. So all these app layers are the key focus for us. Excellent. Uh, so now let oh, go, go ahead, ahead, Fabio. Go ahead, go ahead. So uh, uh, I actually asked the team to prepare. There's so many, so many tools out there, right, that can help us with different things. Um, and sometimes that's the complexity. But at least they're there. They're pretty awesome. So you guys have gone through a lot of uh, arguments and agreements. <laughs> but we got to a stack of tools that we're using. So I asked the team to share some of those. Are that going to be interesting to all of you? OK, so here's. Uh, Here's some of the tools that we've uh, chosen. Um, can you guys walk us through a few of them? I think the, the, the fir I'll talk about the first one, right? The first decision that we made, which was about the uh, uh, Kubernetes. So it's the last one here, which is our container orchestration. And we went through some discussion about, OK, sh sh I think there was an agreement that we need this abstraction layer. Right? Whether we use Kubernetes or Marathon Mesos or uh, Docker Swarm, right? So we had lots of discussion. And we ended up with Kubernetes for a couple of reasons. A, it gives you a very comprehensive set of uh, um, um, uh, mechanisms that makes your life much, much easier. Um, and also, the community around it was very vibrant, and we saw lots of innovation that can come through that. So that was our first tool that we picked. Right. And then uh, on the logging and monitoring side, we try to be aligned with the CNCF, uh, the Cloud Native Foundation uh, choices. And the reason is not just uh, uh, to be aligned with the standard. The reason is that usually this tool have a better integration from the beginning with the inner uh, specifics of the services and container you run. So the advantage is that instead of you having to instrument these tools to connect the data, for instance, logging and metrics that you collect, they will be already done through the labeling that Kubernetes has. Let's say when you deploy a service, you call it service A. That service A information will be available both on your metrics and on your logging. So then you can correlate the data. And let's see, when you have a problem, you can go and see there is a spike in my time it takes to do something. I can go and search for the logs on the same service and see you know, what, the what, what happened. And it will be easier to do troubleshooting. We also use the open trace technology. And we are integrating that, too, in the same fashion. So now you have a round trip in the service. You can see metric spike on consumption, memory, or other resources. And then you can correlate to the logs. And then when you go to very you know, fine-grained distributed application, it's very important not to, to get a big picture, uh, which becomes harder than in traditional applications. So as, you, as you're kind of going through this transition to cloud native, you sort of, once you make the decision like, like we made to do Kubernetes, you're given then a sort of architecture of how Kubernetes wants to be deployed. And you have your worker nodes, you have your master nodes, and you have certain functionality that's needed in those different environments. And then as you deploy our applications on top of that, there's certain interactions that you're looking for within those deployments. And so at, at that point, that's when this whole discussion of which tool uh, or set of tools that we need to look at. And that's, um, there's a, there's a the CNCF, the Cloud Native Foundation, has a landscape uh, pro project that's open source that gives you a lot of different tools that we, we looked at and selected from. And then there's projects that have been accepted by the CNCF that are, are easier choices in some of these, these examples. But even if it's not, like even if you don't like Nginx, for instance, there, there are other projects out there that are like Nginx that you can look at that will give you options that, that, you, that may benefit what you're trying to accomplish. 
Excellent. So, so maybe one also interesting thing, uh, the point of debate that we had and we're still having <laughs> is, um, so when you are deploying on a cloud service like AWS, there are a whole set of tools that comes with AWS. Um, so would you choose to deploy with these uh, uh, tools or would you choose the CNCF, some of the, the you know, cloud native kind of tools that comes with Kubernetes? Um, and um, I think both sides of the equation, uh, you can argue both sides. For us, for example, when we did the logging, we decided not to go with the AWS logging and to uh, deploy uh, the Elk stack with Fluent D. Um, and one of the reasons for that was we have labs, and the labs were not AWS based, and we wanted to, to keep our labs independent. Um, so uh, we needed logging there, so we needed some technology that is independent of what we have in AWS. Also, we had some security um, mandate where, for example, how to get access control for something like your logs needed to be tied to the Cisco SSO system. And though we could have done that with AWS, it would be yet extra component that we need to deploy there uh, to do this connection, whereas it's much easier with a system like uh, um, uh, Elastic Kibana and, and, and so on. So yep. it's, it's, it's a very interesting point of debate, and it goes all through the tool set. The other aspect that you always have to put into consideration is how much uh, of your project needs are cloud agnostic, right? Do you want to, in the future, be able to move from one cloud provider to another cloud provider? So if you are interested in being able to do such a thing, then Kubernetes should be your entry point. So that way, whatever you deploy as, as at the Kubernetes level, it doesn't matter on which cloud you run. In fact, you could take the entire thing and run it on the bare metal on your data center in the future if you want to. But now if you start to leverage the different components that the cloud provider offer you, this migration will become more and more difficult and more costly, up to a point that usually will become impossible. And that's why, you know, there aren't, even if they talk about hybrid cloud and all this cloud movement, when, when someone has a workload in a cloud, it's very difficult to move from a public cloud to another one because of the investments being made in leveraging those tools. To, to add into that, one of the things that's interesting, whenever you're having a conversation about choices, everybody's afraid of lock-in, but the, the question always is, is no matter what your choices are, you're locked in someplace. You just have to decide at what layer in your choices do you want to be locked in. Do you want to be locked in at the Kubernetes layer? Well, that means you have more work to do because you have to answer the questions on top of it, but now you have future choices. But if you want less work, you can choose to be locked in all the way at the top of a full platform as a service stack, like a, a, an entire Cloud Foundry stack, or AWS, or Azure. But at that point, you've now kind of sold yourself and connected yourself tightly to that point. So the lock-in will be there no matter what choices you make. The question is, at what point do you want your flexibility? Yep. And also, if I may add there as well, is that the amount of work and investment when you decide, for example, that you want to lock at the Kubernetes level uh, rather than at the higher level has become less. So in the past, uh, it was very hard or harder to deploy and uh, operate things like an Elk stack. Today with Kubernetes, it's becoming much, much easier to do that. So if you choose not to lock at the higher level, but to look at the Kubernetes level, the amount of investment that you are doing, especially the, the running investment, is not as big as it used to be. So that was one of the arguments that we had for making some of the choices, like we are going to deploy our own logging stack rather than use Amazon. I mean, part of our philosophy is also we want to try more things. We want to learn fast. We want to fail faster than learn fast. So all of the things listed here, it doesn't mean that it's set in stone, right? Like, uh, you know, still we're having this debate of shall we, you know, using Jenkins or versus using John for our CI/CD pipeline. And I also remember the very first debate that we have is which programming language that we should use for the call services. Should it be Golang or should it be Java? Because you know, one is very efficient and very uh, trending up. The other one is very easy to find the developers on the market. So again, you know, this debate is keep going on. Yeah. And, and Golang one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you can, 
You just go along. <laughs> one, one of the things I like to try to like break this argument down into is it's sort of around service level agreements for usability, right? So when you, when you look at Hank, for instance, from, from a user of a platform, you don't really care what decisions I've made about how I'm going to run and operate that platform. But if you want to do something, you need to be able to do it, right? I'll, I'll, I'll edit that. I don't care what decisions you made as long as your decisions haven't forced me into something that I that is difficult or makes my job harder. So let's right. actually go into that. So, so Hank, you come in as a user to the platform. Um, he's not your enemy, guys. He's your customer. customer. <laughs> so uh, what made you excited about using a DevNet Cloud platform? So, so like prior, what was the promise? Yeah, yeah. So prior to having a platform that's provided by the team that we can consume, as an evangelist building demo applications, leveraging Cisco technologies, non-Cisco technologies, working with customers to solve problems, at this point, when I have to build a demo application, I feel like I'm an arms dealer. I'm out there looking to, to, can I use this technology for that? And where do I deploy it? And who's got a credit card on an AWS account I can use? Or I actually have been maintaining my own lab in a Cisco office for years. And I'm really excited about having something that I get to offload those tasks that aren't as important. When I want to build an application, I want to build an application. I want to focus on what makes the customer excited, what solves the customer problem. I don't want to focus on making sure that my slaves and my Kubernetes cluster are open. I want someone else to deal with that. But in order for that to be successful, I have to make sure that when I deploy my application, I get everything that I need. I need to make it easy to access. I need to make sure that my code updates work. I need to make sure that I don't have to go learn Golang to build my application. So those are the choices that go through. And as the, the DevNet platform is evolving and offering more higher level abstraction that we can consume, all of, a lot of those pieces will go away where I have to go find my own answer for questions. So as the platform has evolved and offering continuous development choices and offering methods for us to deploy applications that are easy for external users to access and solve login problems with social login as a constant one we have. Is we want people to be able to log in through GitHub or Facebook or Twitter, not have to jump through the hoops that we, some of the hoops that we have today. Those will make it easier for us to do it. And that's this evolution that we have. And, and as much as, as, as a user of the, pro, the platform, we question, why are we spending so much time on Elk Stack versus this? I understand those problems need to be solved. We're just excited to see us get to the, the usability layers, where we can actually start leveraging and deploying interesting applications on top of the platform. But it's a little bit interesting that, though, before this platform existed, it was still hard for you, even though there's yeah. so many tools out there. Absolutely. Well, I, I had like a plethora of tools. Um, we, we don't have information uh, problems these days. We have information overload. We have tool overload. And I'm OK with like filtering it down a little bit. It's the problem that I think a lot of customers have today is if you filter it too far and give only certain choices, um, that's the issue. It's finding that nice mixture. But, but why couldn't you just do what you wanted to do using Amazon and Google? I can, but then, I then I'm responsible for all of those other pieces. I want to be a consumer of a cloud. I don't want to be consuming and operating and choosing all at the same time. And so the problem is you still deploying. have to do all of that. It's right. not just free as an app developer. Correct. You still need more somebody, somebody has to make these choices and manage this platform. It'd be, if I have to do it myself, I'll do it myself. If I can consume it, that's much better. Ken, you were about to say? I was just saying that you know, it, it's, it's a combination of, of that service level agreement, understanding what the user needs, and the point that Hank made really well, if, you, if you're abstracting away so much information that he doesn't get access to the logs, he doesn't get the ability to see his application has been deployed successfully, then you, you sort of broke that SLA between the end user and the platform, right? Yeah. But on the other hand, you know, we also don't want to ask Hank to call Amazon when the cluster goes down, right? Because now, now he has a headache because Amazon doesn't know who he is, and he's going to say, hey, this DevNet stuff isn't working, and Amazon would say DevNet, what's that, right? And so it's, you, you kind of have like different layers of abstraction and complexity and you have to kind of look at each of those layers, each of those choices that we've made in here, all the way up to these tools even, and make sure that the right level of abstraction is there for the end user, but they also can do what they need to do efficiently and without you know, hiding information from them. And that's, that's the trick of a lot of this. It's that, kind of a, all right, it's not really a science. And I think that the challenge that has resulted in, in all of the statistics, I'm sure we've all heard about cloud projects failing and 95% of clouds fail, 
it's not that the cloud fails, it's, it's missing these requirement conversations between the people building the cloud and those that are consuming it. Because one person's cloud may be perfect for one team, but completely atrocious for the other team. And you have to have that dialogue up front, otherwise you'll get to the end of a project and you're, you have a cloud, but nobody wants to use it. Because it doesn't meet the requirements, it doesn't have the abstraction level layer that your, your developers are expecting. Uh, so if I can ask, uh, does anybody in the audience have any questions? Yes, Adrian. And then uh, I'll ask a few more questions. I'll come back to you guys for more questions as well. Right. Go ahead. Um, so, so far, what's been the hardest part for you um, moving from the existing DevNet platform to uh, cloudification? I think the, the hardest part has been uh, um, moving the team from a concept of developers to DevOps. Right? So when uh, you are in a mentality where you are focusing only on adding functionality or requesting functionality to the vendor, right? Because we either add to existing solutions or we ask vendor to add them, then you never you never care about how this thing is gonna run. It's gonna be performant enough. Uh, does it stand up? Does it collapse? What are the uh, re remedy uh, solutions I need to put in place when things don't go smoothly, right? And so you need to move to that mentality where I not only develop, but then I have the ownership of making sure that what I develop runs smoothly and, uh, you know, is providing the service it's supposed to do. I think what, what I've discovered is, is something that we probably will learn more about over the next coming months, but it's, it's to the point that Hank sort of made, it's really about the education aspect because up to this point, as you heard Edwin describe, pretty much every little group has done their own little silo of application development, right? And now we're going to say, we want you to move to this platform and here are these common set of services that are available to use. And even though, like you said, identity and registration has been a problem, just wait till like everyone registers in the same system. That's going to be a, even a bigger problem. And so. Um, these are things that like, if you don't help educate the, the teams and the businesses on how to use the cloud platform, that's the other issue of no one's going to use it because you built something that, that you didn't ask them for their input and they don't, they don't like the way you did it or they don't understand how to use it so they just say that it's too hard to use. So on the education side as well, um, building a monolithic application at the beginning is much easier than building a distributed system. And then as the system becomes more and more complex, then it reverses. So the distributed system would become much easier, whereas the monolithic system would become much more difficult. But the bottom line is that there is an investment around building a distributed system and the infrastructure that's needed to support that. And if you go um, uh, from a team that's used to building a monolithic system and convert that into a distributed system, uh, we learned that you need to set the expectations correct, that there is an upfront investment that needs to be paid in order to reap the benefits in the future. Um, without this, people get very impatient uh, and you know, consider that you are going slowly, whereas you're going really fast, but you will see that later. Nermeen, are you talking about me? No, I think it's something that I have seen in multiple <laughs> places, kidding, right? Kidding. And I think it's our fault. We need to, as a, as, 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 as an arc, building a new platform, you need to set up the correct um, <laughs> expectation. Yes. Yeah, one thing I want to add is, uh, you know, when we say we want to move these services into a platform, it doesn't mean that we just, you know, copy whatever feature it has. Because moving to a new platform unlocks a lot of opportunity that we can create a better experience, we can add more features. So a lot of discussion also around like, hey, there are so many things we can do. What are the things that we want to release for the first step? Because you know, if we just move all the things with existing features back to a new platform, we're not creating any new values to our users. We, that's the things that are also very difficult for us. Is there another question from the audience? Run, Paul, run. Run, Paul, run. <laughs> <laughs> I know we need somebody over here to ask a question with, next. With, uh, <laughs> with, the with the new apps, it's fairly straightforward. You shift your development there. I'm wondering with the legacy applications, how are you guys deciding whether to lift and shift 
or completely rewrite. Because if you lift and shift, you get good backwards compatibility, but you don't get the, really the benefits of being in the cloud. But if you rewrite, then of course you don't get any backwards compatibility. So I'm just wondering, as you guys go through your catalog of existing apps, how you're determining how you make that decision. Fabio. I think in our case, the, the choice was very simple. Um, none of the legacy application would meet the future requirements anyway. So for us, it was a, a rewrite. Now, what we did, though, uh, we didn't do a complete rewrite, right? Because that's very dangerous, right? And to get management very nervous because you're going to embark in a year program to basically rewrite everything. So what we did is that <laughs> we took a piece of functionality and we start to rewrite that piece of functionality, adding new features to it. So that demonstrated that we can rewrite it and also unlock some new value that wasn't there before. And so we are going to keep doing this, and we're going to add this foundation services, which is going to be the glue or the components that are going to help to build new applications. So think about you, when you move to microservices, your code reuse is in the microservice. In the past, you had these like, libraries they would write. Now think about a library as a microservice that is going to be used by several other components. I, I think a really important point here is, um, and something that was asked in the question, right, is that you know, when you do a lift and shift, you don't really get the benefits of, of what you're providing in the underlying platform. But when you're running a business and you're, and you're making money on an application, you don't get paid to rewrite your application, right? Your application is out there running, it's making money. I, no business is going to say, stop the application, turn it off. We're not going to make money for the next two quarters while you lift and shift this over here. And so, there's, and to the point that Hank made earlier, right, the user experience is really important. So if you, if you just completely disconnect your entire user base and say, we're going to make you stop and wait while we do something different, that's not going to work either. And so, it, it's sort of the, the approach I think that DevNet um, is pushing on our businesses is here's the benefit and the value of what we're doing. Here are some of the common services, as Fabio calls them, that, are, that you can leverage. Instead of using this legacy registration system that's a real pain and you hate, we have this new registration system and here's how you use it. And I think the, the here's how you use it are creating what I like to say standards around how you move from a monolithic app to this new platform. We have to define those standards, make it very clear and easy for the businesses to understand how to make that transition and then give them pieces that they can consume easier and they can maybe rewrite part of their app over time to take advantage of the new platform and maybe over six to nine months to a year, they can have their entire application moved over without having to do like a lift and shift. Do you guys have more to say about how to uh, yeah, transform a monolithic app to these microservices? More to add there? Yeah, I can, I can, I can take <laughs> this. So uh, don't think about dividing your application like in tiers, right? In, in the past, people have been taught, like, do everything in tiers, like you have your database, back-end tier, application layer tier, front-end tier. Microservices are not designed to work in that way. Of course you can design uh, microservices in that way, but that will be the wrong way. What you really want to do is look at what your application is, what are the functionality the application provide, and separate those functionalities in different services. And then within those services, yes, I can still divide it in front-end, middle-tier, logic-tier, and back-end. But the advantage of doing the function part is that now you can scale them independently, right? And there are, definitely there will be function on your application that has a lot of traffic versus function that are low traffic. And so now I can scale them up in, the, in a completely different way than I, was be, I would be able to do before. And I think that word function is really important because um, I, I started to joke with some companies I work with because they started creating nano services, which were, were these little <laughs> tiny services that were like super, super small, but they were making all these database requests at a rate that was causing the database to crash because they were trying to get too much small information all at the same time. And so um, if you think about like records, you want to basically create a service or a function that's going to let you do a set of tasks that are very common and related to each other but don't have dependencies on other tasks. So if you can create a bunch of separate functions, as Fabio was calling them, and, and remember this concept of you don't want nano services because that's just going to cause a headache. <laughs> yeah. So keep them micro, not nano. 
So microservices are good, nanoservices are bad. Yeah. Yeah. Pico are terrible. Pico are terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so the other thing I like is, uh, you know, usually like uh, Nami and Fabio, that will do a little anatomy of existing application and service. Like, hey, let's look at different modules. What are the things that can be used by other services and other applications? For example, like, hey, if this application has a workflow uh, module that can do you know, approval, drafting, and review these different status, right? maybe it makes sense that extract that as a state machine that can be reused by all other applications. And you know, let's look at, like, hey, um, if this one has a catalog service, that all other applications that can also use it refer to and when they register a new items uh, into the system. So those kind of the practice, I think, is really good for you rewrite, uh, you change your monolithic application to a microservices thing. A piece that goes into that, the concept of shared microservices that go through, is a challenge that organizations can get. Because if you've got uh, several, most, most companies have more than one application. So if you have several micro or um, monolithic applications today and you're trying to migrate those to microservices, you will find each application has like repeated things. Everybody needs a database, everybody needs uh, image structures, everybody needs approval. Um, but in current state, everybody assumes that their way of doing it is right. Mm -hmm. And that transition into microservices where you want to have shared resources, can, you can run against um, accountability and responsibility barriers. People don't want, application owners may not want to be willing to give up that to somebody else uh, to consume it as a service because trust. I don't trust them that they're going to do it as well as I can, or I want to make sure I'm accountable for that. And so just like the, the coding parts are different, there's, there's a culture change that goes with monolithic to microservice style as well. And, and knowing that you are now consuming a service, service is part of microservice for a reason. It's something you're going to consume. It has an SLA attached to it. You really shouldn't care too much about how it works as long as it provides the, expect or the expected promise. And that's a big part of the switch as well, is not just code, it's culture. So as we're yeah. uh, talking about that, so what does it take in to sh shift a development team into a DevOps team? Black magic. <laughs> <laughs> well, so what have you guys Lots found? Unicorns. I think the, 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 the thing is to explain to the team and convince them that they are responsible for the code not at the point where they have their code complete, but all the way till the code is upgraded, right? So a developer is responsible from the point they have finished their code all the way to when it, it's not used anymore. So when there is a problem in production, it is the developer issue. So, um, so that shifts the mentality from I am developing to I am developing something that I need to operate. And I think if you can make that shift in the team, then people are going to think about monitoring, about uh, performance uh, management and, and, and profiling as part of their job, not as part of someone else's job that's happened after development. Oh, also, and I think you need to, oh, sorry, I, I, you need to uh, reward failure. Because in the transition, people will fail, OK? They are developers. Now they become DevOps. They need to deploy things. They don't know. They make mistakes. And so failure is something you need to reward for people to be confident and to have the ability to embark in new things they weren't doing before, right? The other aspect is that. What's an example of rewarding failure? So an example of rewarding failure is if um, your service is not running as expected or is impacting other services, what you, avoid, you want to avoid is finger pointing, right? My service is down, now the other services are impacted, but we are all in this boat together because now all the services are tightly coupled, they talk to each other. So the fact that I'm responsible for service A, it doesn't mean that service B is not going to be on the same boat I am. The other thing you need to do is to put a CSO, a chief sanity officer, because all the microservices team will want to develop with their own way, and they want to use their own databases, they want to use their own technologies, but you need to make sure that they have a very, very good explanation why they want to use a different database from another team, because everything they use, they need to maintain. And so you want to end up having 50 databases just because, oh, I really like Mongo, and she likes Cassandra, and someone else likes MySQL. But in reality, we could use one database because it would be enough for everything. Yeah, the other thing is um, during the work assignments, it also 
has a lot of changes around. You need to consider the ownership of each microservices. So uh, make people be responsible for you know, the services that they're going to create and also the whole life cycle of the deployment. Because it's not like traditionally you hand it over and you've done with it. Right? And you have this ownership of when it's running, you know, how good performance is, how much uh, bugs it generated. So this kind of ownership also comes into the consideration. And, and I want to say something controversial to kind of get the, the goof route up. But I, I think there's actually three separate roles in, in an organization. I, I, I don't think everyone has to become DevOps to be successful. I think the ops mentality and what operations people bring to an organization is critical, especially for like problem resolution and like fixing long-term issues, right? I think devs, for the most part, like they tried to do DevOps their entire career. I don't think any developer would ever say, I just wrote something and just threw it over the wall and didn't care about it, right? And they've always been the one who gets called when it goes down. And so they're used to that. Um, but there, there, I think there is a role where you have just guys off doing development that maybe aren't, aren't especially on the infrastructure side, aren't as you know, on call as it, when it's in production as they are when it's being developed in the, in the sandbox. But then you do have this new DevOps role that brings the best of those two worlds together. But the point of all of this is that I don't think you can take every ops person, every devs person, and just put them into this DevOps role and say, you're now DevOps. And so going back to the point we made a couple of times, it's really about your culture and how you train and find the people who want to do that role and, and elevate them into that role and give them that opportunity to shine. Let the ops guys that don't want to be DevOps, let them stay ops, let the dev guys stay dev take away responsibility from them because they, if you don't want them to do something mission critical, don't tell them to do something mission critical. <laughs> They're not going to support it, right? Yeah. And so if you understand those three roles and you pick the right people for those three roles, you'll have a lot more success than if you try to force everyone to do something a certain way that's not going to be the best fit for them. But don't make the mistake of to keep them separate. Embed an ops guy in your development team. Yes. That will bring the ops culture into the development team. Yep. It will make people understand I need to understand how this thing ran. I need to be able to restart it at midnight, right, when there is the call. So give me a RAM book, give me instruction how this thing is going to run. So don't keep this separate, because that will be the finger pointing aspect. So take the op guy, put it in the dev, and then the take op... Take the dev guy, put him in the ops, and make, the, them, probably, all no, make probably, them all work together. Make them all work together. Probably not the other way around, but <laughs> ops guys in the dev team will be a good thing. But I think because this is controversial, so I have to, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I think DevOps is not about development and operations, and we are merging them. It's about developing software that can be operated successfully. As a developer, I don't have to operate that. But when I'm developing the software, I have to make sure that my software can be operated easily. It scales. It's, it can, it, when, 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 it, uh, when it fails and restarted, it will restart correctly. It can be monitored. So I think that is what yeah. is DevOps. And each developer has to be that. Otherwise, we are having uh, a software that's very hard to deal with. I think the key is you have one team. You don't right. have separate right. teams anymore. Right? You have one team that's doing Dev and Ops yes. and DevOps. But, but you need different operations. people within yeah. the team. Right. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, so just a, a final questions. You know, how would you advise that people get started, or just what advice do you have for people going forward? So, final words. Oh, crap! I was I was counting on like an entire line to think you of. Think it. Of <laughs> oh, okay. um, I, I, here's my advice: Don't look at this as a bad thing. This transition that's going through. So many times I've talked with engineers that that I walk into a room and I, I sit down and. It's just frowny faces, and everybody's depressed, and they're, they're coming up with excuses about why they can't do it, and they're so different. That's one way to look at it, but I think that that just generates ulcers and like psychiatrist <laughs> bills. Look at this as an opportunity to learn something new. Um, I, I, I get a little preachy when I go into this, but most of us got into this industry because we like technology. We like learning things. We like solving problems. Well, we got a little lazy for a while where things weren't changing as fast. This is an opportunity for us to rebuild our skills. Um, I had a meeting earlier today with a, a, an engineer. He'd been in the network and compute space for 30 years. And he set a time, and he wanted to sit down. And what do I learn now? How do I get started? Which technologies? And we were mapping out, like, start with this piece, and 
once you've got that, then you can learn here. And he was excited about it. And I think that's the biggest advice I have. The attitude. Is be excited about the change. Don't be looking for excuses that you don't have to change. So there are a lot of fancy technologies and tools in this area. Uh, but my advice would be don't be technology driven. So make sure in the discussions that you have a certain amount of the time dedicated for business logic discussions, experience discussions. You know, rather than everything is around, hey, how we discuss this, uh, how we do this cluster, how we do this CICD, how we do all this infrastructure. Yeah, because end of the day, it's to serve a business purpose. So I think um, choosing the uh, right business requirement to start with is quite important. And um, I think we did this right with DevNet. With our first project uh, using this platform was something that's not mission critical. So that helped us to be brave and courageous, right? Um, to experiment with stuff, to try new things, and to reward failure if, we, if, if something is not working. So choose something small and not mission critical and start there. Like an MMMMMMVP. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what we did. <laughs> Can <laughs> I think from, from a, a, just to, and then to add on to what's been said already, that next layer down be below sort of the, you know, looking at the business requirements is sort of looking at what your people that you have available to you are able to accomplish, right? And help, help educate them to the point that Hank was making, help them get excited about learning this. But then I think the next layer below that is what I like to kind of look at as, as an opportunity for all of us is the different business processes that you have, right? And that's kind of where DevNet started with the different uh, common services layer, right? Because it's, to the point that Hank made earlier, it's really difficult to, to, to tease out all of these different um, common components of your application and then get everyone to use those same components because everyone has their own idea of what they want to do. So if you, if you start by helping to educate them, bring them along the journey with you, and then say, here are the common things that we want to help enable across the business, then you accomplish that business goal. If you do it just for the sake of technology, like Edwin said, you're, you're not going to win any of the business guys' minds because they don't care about the technology. They have to deliver business value. And so if you start with the business value, show them how they're going to get the, deliver their solution quicker and at, at the right price point, then they'll be more than happy to work with you and jump on board. If you can't prove them the business value, you're just another IT guy saying, hey, I got a cool technology to show you, and they don't care. Yeah, and for me, it's like, not only start small, but get it, the team uh, start to do the practices of developing and operating, and then start to have people from other groups that are working on or maintaining the legacy application to migrate and rotate in this team. So you get a kind of pollination of the culture and of the experience, and they can see by themselves how better it is when you work on an environment that's is more agile than what you were used before to do these like six months, you know, waterfall designs. And then this will be the advocates when they back in their original teams to basically bring this transition and get the other team member excited about, hey guys, we can really do this and you know, and it's been done and we can, we can move to this new model and it's gonna be easier and funnier for us to work on. I'm disappointed, Excellent. I thought you were gonna talk about monitoring. <laughs> How could you not say monitoring? Yeah, I know, number one and one thing, monitoring. Okay, okay. So, uh, next time. So I, I want to thank you all. So as you can see, uh, the team has been uh, really embracing the new technologies, uh, you know, going through the different arguments, looking at the trade-offs, building it, and I think learning a lot as they're going and producing a lot. So, uh, so I hope that uh, you all found this useful to see you know, what's involved in this journey and, uh, and hope you have some uh, good steps forward. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And Thanks by everybody. the way, we are in D5, the demo booth. So if you want to have a look at what we have been doing, that's where we are sitting. D5. Oh, right there. Yeah. Right there. So you can learn more about the platform over there on D5. OK, thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.